Welcome to this special FCTV oral history of the town of Falmouth. I'm Troy Clarkson, your host, and it is my honor and pleasure to have two very distinguished gentlemen here in Falmouth to share some of their history. You know, the barber shop is always the heart of a community. You can always get the pulse of a community uh, by attending the local barber shop and understanding what's going on in town and, and who the movers and shakers and personalities are in any community. Well, here in Falmouth, there have been many, but two very important local institutions over the years, over the decades, over the last half century, have been Stone's Barbershop and Andy's Barbershop, uh, both which had prominent locations, various locations, in our downtown. And so it's my great pleasure to share some time in this wonderful oral history of our community uh, with two of the icons of barbering in Falmouth, Phil Stone and Andy Dufresne. So please join us as we take a walk down memory lane and explore the history of Falmouth and the history of barbering in Falmouth uh, with two gentlemen who share more than 100 years of barbering in our community. So fellows, welcome. Phil Stone and Andy Dufresne, welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. Troy, thanks for inviting us. Inviting us. So between the two of you, as I just said, you have over 100, 100 years, years of experience of cutting hair and really being the backbone of our community and just about anyone uh, who was anyone over the decades has walked through this door here at Stone's Barbershop or Andy at your shop which was recently closed. So we'll start with you Phil. Before the cameras came on we were talking about the fact that you've been cutting hair uh, since you were in your teens. So tell us the story about how you came to be a barber. Illegally. <laughs> I went to barber school in, between my sophomore and junior year in high school. I took a six-month course in six weeks because my old man paid the barber school double. So they can't arrest him because he's with heaven. So you compressed a six-month course into six weeks and began Cutting hair right after. Now that, uh, that I was that was in the World War II era. No, that was 1952. Oh, it was after. Okay, so so Korean War. But your dad, I know, I'm a had Korean a vet. Yes, you are a proud Navy veteran, as is Andy. Uh, and and so uh, at the time, your dad, Frank Stone, had uh, a barber shop uh, both on, on the. The base, right? Yeah, yeah, he had two or three of which them. Which was then Otis Air Force Base. Yeah, and, it was Camp Edwards. And Camp Edwards, okay. And then you began cutting hair for him, but is it you shine shoes at Stones before you cut hair? I did. So for nearly when I was 70 a kid. years. You're 84 now, so for nearly 70 years, you've been in, in the trade, so to speak. That's right. And that's a similar number for you, Andy. You started, tell us your journey to barbering. Well, my journey to barbering, of course, my father came here in 1927 and bought, uh, I think it was Donnelly's Barbershop across next to Cahoon's Fish Market down on Main Street. Met my mother, and I'm a, I'm a, a product of that, and uh, settled, he settled here. He had uh, two grown sons. One became a barber, one enlisted in the Navy in 1927. And uh, so my start in, in the barbershop, of course, was uh, in 1944. I used to come down from New Bedford. I went to parochial school in the city of New Bedford. And I was a lather boy. I started out my father's shop in 1944 as a lather boy. Uh, get, get them ready, finish them off, shave around the ears, comb their hair. And a wisp room, which I still have in my car, and... Uh, that was my responsibilities, and then in between, shine shoes. That was uh, back in the days when every boy had to work. There was no such thing as taking the whole summer off, so I shined shoes. And surprisingly, back in those days, all the money that I made, and I made as much as 17 to $20 a week shining shoes that I would give to my mother, and my, mo my mother would, my, no, my father, would give me $2 to spend. So back in the days today, most kids, you know, that's my money. I worked for that. Yeah, they worked for it. But back then, we all contributed to the house. Shoe, shine, shoe shines were 10 cents, and uh, if you're lucky, you got 15 cents. 
the GIs from the base. And uh, so it's, for me, it's been a good beginning and uh, taught me how to work young. Caused a hell of a fight between my father and I in uh, 1948 when I made the football team. And uh, he wanted me to come down and work in the barber shop. And I said, well, I can't. I, I'm, I'm going to play the games on Saturday. When he says, you better. And I said, what if? And back then, nobody talked back to their father. The what if, what if ended me with a, with a left hand slap right across the kisser. Never talked back to my father after that. And so again, the history, if you want the history, I can start right now on the history of me as a barber is uh, because of what I learned in my father's shop when I joined the Navy. My first year I was in fire control, which is gun direction. And then there was an opening in ship service. And because of my experience with my father, I spent three years in ship service uh, aboard ship and uh, with more experience than most barbers would ever get, you know. Uh, and I've cut hair from admirals and foreign agents and you name it aboard the, I was in the Pacific Fleet. And uh, so I had plenty of experience. And when I got out, I had to go to barber school because the Korean veterans were not recognized until August and I got discharged in April. So my discharge, because of the experience, I had to go to barber school to get a license. I didn't have you know, a, a contact with, with the barber board at the time. So I financed my way through the barber school uh, with my $300 bonus, discharge bonus, and my wife gave me uh, we were married. I got married in between Korean trips, and uh, she uh, she used to give me twenty dollars a week. She worked in the Venetian blinds in New Bedford, and uh, so they finally approved the Bobus, uh Korean veterans in August, but the school that I went to was not approved until October. So technically. I got screwed, and I'll use that, whether we're on TV or not, out of, quote, the GI Bill, even though I spent four years in the Navy, two Korean trips, my ship lost 58 men, and uh, uh, combat, we were right off the Korean coast. Ship still holds the, the record of the number of rounds fired in a six-month period. But all of that is the history of me growing up. and. Uh, I look back and have no regrets whatever. When I came to discharge, I went to work for my father. That didn't last very long because he, him and I had difference of opinions of what a haircut should look like. And uh, I have had a, a very successful barbering career in different shops. So we'll get to those shops in a minute and thank sure. you for your service. So as you've both joked over the years, uh, Andy, you have a few years on Phil. So, Phil, you were in the Navy as well, but shortly after Andy, because you're just a few years younger than he. But tell us about your service in the Navy, because you served around the same time. I went in the Navy uh, right after graduation in 1954. Hmm. I was on a, a World War II ship destroyer, and we were a radar picker ship, picket ship. And we saw plenty of ocean, but we didn't go to Europe or China or any place like that. So I get kidded with all my friends because I had a good friend, Bob Joseph, who went to Europe and everything else. He, he and I were in boot camp together. His father was a commander at Woods Hole at the Coast Guard base. And we went in right after high school. So I, I saw as much deep water as anybody, but I never saw the beautiful Hawaiian islands. I went with your mother to the Hawaii, but that was on my dime, not Uncle Sam's. <laughs> so well, with, uh, with that kind of an expression, I, Uncle Sam paid my way to five beautiful stops 
in Hawaii on the way to China. I, well, saw, I, the, I saw the China coast from uh, uh, Korea all the way down to uh, Singapore and uh, Borneo. I did a, a complete tour of, of, uh, of the Pacific before the Korean War. So I had beautiful cruises, plenty of ocean, Philippines five times. I, I tell you, I just, I can get talking about Uncle Sam's uh, trips that he gave me, and I have no regrets whatever. Just to put it in perspective, what's amazing is these trips that we were talking about, uh, your service to our country was between 60 and 70 years ago. Yeah. And it was after your Navy service that both of you came uh, to Falmouth yes. and then started your careers as barbers. So uh, that, I think, for our viewers, helps put things in perspective. What we're talking about are lives in this community that unfolded over the last 70 years, and here we sit able to talk about it. So, uh, it, you know, that that's the real gift of what we're doing today is that you get to share your history, but your history is part of Falmouth's history. Yeah. So you yeah. both came back after your service in the Navy uh, and started your careers here. So Phil, your dad uh, helped you uh, get that license in a compressed amount of time. And Andy, you went to barber school. So walk us through. So now we're in the, we're in the mid to late 50s here in Falmouth. Where was, uh, so you and your dad worked together, but then you went out on your own. Uh, I, went, I went out on my own because uh... Uh, we we just had a difference of opinion on 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 cutting hair. It's well, you've never been uh, uh, shy in sharing your opinions on haircuts, Andy. I mean, I've been involved in politics and government here in the community for close to thirty years now, and we've always joked about my haircut. Yeah, and it was most of those thirty years was the guy sitting next to you that gave yeah. it to me. Yeah, no, yeah, but I knew that. <laughs> I, I knew that. With me, with me, barbering has never been personal. Uh, it's been personal. For the barbers, I, I've never considered uh, Stone's Barbershop a competitor because they were very busy and so was I. So, you know, I, I started my my civilian uh, life actually politically uh, in 1954 when I helped organize the. Uh, uh, oh God, how can I forget? Teaching the kids how to weightlift at the at the municipal. Uh, Community building. Uh, oh God, we had a name for it. But anyway, and hey, Andy, I'll let, give you some of my memory pills to help you. <laughs> well, you, you know, you were probably too busy playing golf or whatever. Right? I, never, I, I never had that uh, that bad habit. But I, I did start out. Uh, oh Jesus, I wish I like to remember. The whole, it was an organization, oh, for Police Athletic League. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I knew that. Right. One of the police early Athletic edition, League. long before my brother brought it back in yeah. the, the, the 90s or early 2000s. Your right. brother brought it back to Falmouth. Right. Andy was in the PAL in New Bedford. No. No, we organized right here in Falmouth. Well, yeah. you and died. Louis, and Louis Seuss, Cause, it yeah. died. It died when they got into go-karts and a lot of other things. I had 58 kids that I was teaching how to lift weights because I was a pretty good sized guy when I was younger. And, uh, and most of it was for the safety of lifting weight so that you don't hurt yourself. Sure. And, uh, and then I went on to, I can remember somebody saying, you know, you're Arthur Vidal, young Arthur Vidal when he was young and I, I knew him in high school. And he said to me, he says, you know, he says, you ought to get involved. And I says, what? He says, well, he's for the town. So I wish I could remember the guy's name that I took his place on the beach committee. Because I went to his house and said, what does job involve being a beach commissioner? Because in Falmouth back then, <coughs> the beach commissioners were elected autonomous public officials. Had 78 men nine beaches, and we had uh, sole authority other than town meeting. And I did that for eight years, eight years, and uh, developed a certain element of uh, 
what goes on in town hall. And we presented our case and we, oh, one of my first controversies was to uh, limit the head of the beaches, and I, he was a coach, and he used to have all out, out, outside kids come down and gave them jobs on the beaches. So I served with a guy, Joe, uh, Joe Corey and uh, Milt Carlson. And one of my first controversies, I, I told the, the, the old head of the beaches, I said, I'm going to give you four jobs. I said, the rest are all going to be local employment. And back then we had all local lifeguards hired the first female lifeguard to teach kids because we found that kids, uh, young kids, four or five years old, reacted better uh, with female lifeguards. We used to have all the lifeguards trained at Mass Maritime. We made arrangements for that. And I had 78, 78 employees and uh, li lifeguards and, and maintenance, two trucks, and served the town for all of those years until they talked me into going on the finance committee. You know, that history most of you guys are pretty well aware of. Yeah, well, and that's sort of when our, uh, our lives converged. That would be in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, when you were on the finance committee, but back to just for a minute, back to the barbering. So, Phil, we are uh, seated here in Stone's Barbershop uh, through the the uh, the generosity of Trish Stone, uh, who uh, who currently owns and operates Stone's Barbershop, um, and she continues the the Stone legacy. Stone's has been here on this site here on on Main Street uh, for about thirty five years, right? It was nineteen eighty six or nineteen eighty five or so. When I you moved here? I remember it well. I don't know what year it was, but when we we originally were on Main Street downtown. I call it Times Square. Right, where the LaRue Kitchen store is today. No. We were next to Harvey's Hardware okay. when I was five or six years old. Okay. When I got into Barbarin, we were downtown. Opposite Ben Ben and Bills, and we had a two businesses there: a beauty salon, and a which my mother and my wife ran, and we had the barber shop, which my father and and supposedly I ran, but it was all him. Ah, <laughs> uh, and so then in the mid '80s you moved here to this spot, right? And. Uh, we this used to be Carolicus's vegetable place or whatever you call right, it. Do yeah. you remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah. When when Dick Kensler, my uncle Dick, he he bought our block and he forced us out of there. And so John Carolicus, who was a customer of ours, he said to my brother and me, my father was gone. He says, why don't you come up to my place? He owned all this property. And he's going out of business, so we moved the Bobby Beauty Shop up here from Main Street, Times Square. And we've been here for the last 20 years. Yeah, actually, probably, I'm going to guess 35 or so, because I remember in high school helping to paint these walls when you were first moving in here. So you've been in several different locations. Now, Andy, folks, obviously, you had an, another iconic location similar to this one where you were in the Falmouth Plaza for many, many years. Tell us about how you wound up there, because I've heard that story before, and, well, and I, oh, any God. locations you were at before then. Yeah, uh, just one correction. In listening him to him speak, Stone's Barbershop originally it was a beauty salon, and Stone came, it was his sister, I believe. And he I don't bought, think he that. I agree with yeah. him. Yeah, and that's yeah. Harvey's, was next to Harvey's Hardware. We had this difference of opinion earlier, before, and uh, then 
uh, he moved to the downtown area, which was a very, very busy barbershop. Stone's Barbershop in the center of town was very busy. San Susi's Barbershop was the next one, which is now the, the hardware store. Mm -hmm. So, San Susi's was next to Eastman's Hardware. Eastman's Hardware was. I I, I imagine, and I realize that you're an old guy, Andy, and your memory is <laughs> is not too good. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you don't, I, I don't wait, want you to get wait, mad bet, at me. I like you. Yeah, I'll bet you don't remember Joe Chappelle. I do. Huh? He had San Susie's Barber Shop. No, he worked there. Well, so I, this is but this, is, great, this is why it's so great to be yeah. together because two guys yeah. uh, that yeah. have been part of this community yeah. for seven decades sharing <laughs> their shared history is just it's so important to capture that so that future yeah. generations watching. This show yeah. uh, will understand what a rich history we have, not just in barbering, because both of you, in different ways, have been part of the community. Yeah. So you were in Falmouth Plaza for many, many years until you closed recently, but uh, how did you wind up there? Uh, I had a little shop. My father and I had that difference of opinion, and I didn't want to open a shop in town because he still had Dufresne's Barber Shop uh, next to uh, next to the fish market, ne right next to Cahoon's fish market, across the street from the fire station. Okay, so Boxwood Circle area. Yeah, N yeah, yeah. No, no, right with Co Cahoon's fish market, right on Main Street. Oh, okay. Where Steve's Pizzeria is. Oh, all right. Huh? Yeah. How about that for history? Excellent. That's why yeah. we're here. That's yeah. great. Keep it coming. Yeah, but anyway, uh, don't I, forget Harry. I started there, and. Uh, my father had a difference of opinion, so I went to work with Harry Kemet Harris, who had and just... And Harry worked for Frank Stone. Right. And he helped me get learn the business. Harry. And Harry. Yeah, Harry, Harry. I worked with Harry. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, Harry and I worked together for six years, and uh, then he ended up taking over the base barber business. And I ended up going off on my own. I ended up on the shop in East Falmouth. Young Arthur Lydell was a customer of mine. And I was there for uh, two or three years. And when the plaza was being built, uh, I approached the, uh, the manager, who was a customer of mine. His name will come to me in a little, in a little bit. Let me give you some of my memory pills, Andy, uh -huh. to help you out a little bit. <laughs> anyway, uh, I ended up, uh, where was I? I ended up in East Falmouth. At the plaza. You spoke to the manager yeah. there. Yeah, and I, I told the manager of the then Stop and Shop, who was very well connected with the whole uh, corporation that owned all these plazas and uh, said that uh, they had provided for a beauty salon but not a barber shop. So they got in touch with me and they said, well, uh, how much space do you need? So my shop in East Family was 35 by 35. And I says, well, I says, uh, oh, they said, okay, we'll get back to you. So when they came back to me, they said, could you work in a shop? 10 feet wide. So that was a big reduction based on how the barbershops were set up. So like this here, this is the old-fashioned setup. The customers were always there in the barbershop in front. So anyway, uh, I said, sure, I can make it work. Because on one of my trips to Florida, I went to a barbershop in Coral Gables, and that shop was 15 feet wide, long and narrow. And I ended up setting up a shop that I spent uh, 57, 58 years in over there in the plaza until the, car, the, vi the virus put me out of business. Yeah. So, but that was a, a, a long and, and storied history. I know I've asked you both over the years as you cut hair in those locations for more than a half a century, you've had people sit... Phil, in these very chairs, these are chairs that have been with stones since the previous location. Uh, so the chairs that in which you're sitting 
have seen some pretty amazing people. So I'm going to ask you both the same question. We'll go with you first, Phil. But over the years, because Falmouth has for decades been a location where people from all over the world come to visit, you've had the opportunity to cut uh, hair for some pretty famous and interesting people. So tell us about a couple of those. I cut Cesar Romero's hair. Uh, hair. He was the Joker. Right. Remember him? I sure do. So and for those of a certain age, Cesar Romero was the Joker in the original Batman TV series. Yeah. Also an accomplished a classic yeah. actor. Okay. And I cut Dana Andrews' hair and Carl Yastrzemski's hair. So tell us about Yaz. He, he spent the summer here with Tony Canigliaro, who got hit in the eye. Right. And he came to Falmouth to open up a nightclub. Tony C. did. Tony C. did, where Zax is now. Where's, where's Zax? Out on Sandwich Road. Yeah. Yeah. That it would be Charlie, Charlie Rogers' Rodrick. old place. Yeah. yeah. You remember that, Andy. And Dickie yeah. was a bartender there for him, you know. My right. My brother, Dick. Right. Uh, anyway, Tony C. talked Yaz, and he come to me for two or three haircuts. I said, hey, I must have given him a pretty good haircut because he came back two or three times. So Tony C. and Yaz and Cesar Romero. Andy, tell us, about, there must have been a few people over the years that you remember sat in your chair. Uh, a couple probably from uh, the Playhouse, but none that really stands out. I, uh, uh, Frank Sinatra's son-in-law. There's a name there, but he was very famous in the Playhouse. But to me, everybody was important, and uh, I've done some political figures, some high military figures, and you know, and every every hair because yes sir no sir thank you please like my father taught me back in the forties and used the duster to clean them off, and barbering to me is uh, there was no no specials. Uh, J K Lilly I gave I gave J K Lilly a haircut after he waited for his turn like everybody else. There was nobody special, and uh, I can truly say we just ran a nice. Steady barbershop. But that's a great point because the barbershops are the great equalizer. Whether you're J.K. Lilly or Carl Yastrzemski yeah. or just plain old Troy Clarkson, when you come into the barbershop, everybody sits in the bench. They wait their turn. Yeah. Uh, they may wait for their special person or, yeah. to cut their hair. Yeah. But sitting on the bench, everybody's the same. Yeah. Uh, but you guys obviously didn't stand alone in your shops, right? You had uh, other iconic people in this community that stood alongside you for many years. Phil, you mentioned just a minute ago, for you, it was your brother Dick who stood by your side for decades. Yeah. And we lost Dickie a few years ago, but he still, for many, is a, is a real a memorable, iconic person in this community who contributed a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, like Andy, gave a lot back to the community. And, of course, Augie Perry, for nearly 50 years, stood between yeah. you or beside you and your brother. And, and really contributed a lot to the shop as well. So yeah. talk to us just a little bit about Dickie and Augie, what they meant to Stones over the years. Uh, they all had a good following, as mm -hmm. I did too. Uh, and we had three of the best barbers on Cape Cod. And my brother Dick was more like Andy, and he got involved with the town's workings. And mm -hmm. I was a, a, always a back row guy. And, and Andy, you know, Billy uh, stood by you for what most of your time at the shop there, right? And 55, 56 years. 56 years. 56 years. Amazing. And we never had a disagreement. Never had a disagreement. We never went out socially. He had his people that of his age and... Uh, when I when I got involved with uh, with the town, which and of course that history is pretty well known by now, the years that I served, and I'm going to go back to from uh, the PAL to the uh, finance committee. No, beach committee first. Then I went to the finance committee, 
And after the finance committee, you got known, I got known publicly, and people thought I may have something to contribute, so I ended up running for selectman, and I lost the first election to Dr. Jones. And uh, I didn't get discouraged. I tried the second time, and I beat Doc Jones. And uh, then I went into town hall and worked there for, I left the barber shop for three years, went to work in town hall, a little controversial, took no back, no back talk from too many people. As far as I'm concerned, what's right is right, and, you know, which I've done in my, in my political life. Uh, to me, there was no special people. The law is the law is the law. I was a special police officer for 20 years, and uh, very, very active in every one of the jobs uh, that I undertook in my 50 years of government participation. And uh, to this day, I'm still welcomed into town hall, although it's beginning to change a little bit since we have a new form of government now that uh, I don't quite agree with every, everything that's being done, but and I stay out of the picture. I don't go to one end of the town hall I don't go to. I still go to the veterans office because I'm I was on the Veterans Council. I, st I think I still am on the Veterans Council, but I don't. I'll be 90 years old pretty soon. I don't. I don't want to step into the picture too much. Well, but uh, <laughs> you and I share a lot of that history, oh, right? Yes. So you were on the board of selectmen. Now that's back when the selectmen were full time. Full time. Uh, yeah. And shortly after your term on the board, uh, the town changed its government. So. It's funny, I still think of it as the new form of government, but actually that was 1991 when it changed. Yeah. So it's been around for a little while. Yeah. Uh, but I came in, of course, right after that change in yeah. 1993 yeah. and became a member of the Board of Selectmen. Right. Uh, and so I, like you, got involved at a young age, and you and I have a lot of that shared history. And I yeah. think although that incident with your dad uh, uh, may have changed the way you spoke to him, I think that maverick streak that you have uh, continued throughout your service in government, and I mean that as a compliment, because yeah. over the years, you have always been someone that was not afraid to speak up for something you thought was right. Yeah. You and I have disagreed over the years, but yeah. here we sit, Andy, 30 years later yeah. as friends yeah. and people who care about this community. And I know Phil, although he wasn't uh, active, as he said, he was a, uh, a back row guy, the politics of the community occurred here in Stone's Barbershop and in Andy's Barbershop because nobody, as far as I remember, in the heyday of your two institutions, nobody got elected to any position in this community without stopping in Stone's and Andy's I Barbershops. Agree. I right? agree. The candidates. And Phil, yeah. you, you and your brother Dick had, a, a, I think, a very egalitarian policy, and that is that uh, anyone that wanted to put a sign in the window could and, st yeah. and still can. Then uh, they can. But you had really a sort of a rite of passage. Now, it was different for me because Phil's my stepdad, right? So I obviously was going to come in here when I was running for office. But anybody that ran for selectman had to go to Stones and had to go to Andy's. Yeah. And probably back in the day, you mentioned Harry Camateris a little while ago. Yeah. Of course, his family's still very much in town. His daughter, Anne, served honorably as a public school teacher for many, many years in this community. Uh, so that public service was instilled because I think... That, this is where politics and government yeah. happen. I used to call Andy's and Stone's the town hall annex because yeah. that's where stuff got discussed and talked yeah. about. But, you know, every one of the positions that I've held, I've had one or more controversies. I remember the Beach Committee. I was a brand new member of the Beach Committee. There was three of us, and we were autonomous. And I banned parking on certain drive. You want to see... If you read the headlines of the newspapers back then of all the people that lived in that section of town, they used to drive their cars right into the dune. And of course, being a semi-environmentalist that I am, I said, for Christ's sake. So, I said, so anyway, I banned it. Well, sure enough, I ended up <clears throat> in, in, right going before the Board of Selectmen. All right. And uh, I can remember John DeMello. John DeMello saying to me, well, Andy, if that's the way you feel about it, I said, John, 
I said, as far as I'm concerned, I says, we have ample parking. I says, the dunes, I says, and then I started a dune restoration program. If you go down now and, and surf drive and see how beautiful that dune looks from the, from the, uh, the bath house all the way down to the river, uh, the, the inlet that comes in, it was never there, you know. Fresh river, you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. whatever. But anyway, I, I started it out by, uh, they used to truck the seaweed to the dump, right? Just that corner was full of seaweed. So I had them take the seaweed and the stones, we used to grade the beaches and all the stones, and put them right near the road, cover it with seaweed, and then cover it with a little bit of, of sand. And today is the result of all those years of building that dune. So I, I guess what I'm talking about was when you're a public official and you have something to offer that's in the best interest of the town, you can't worry about one or two person that don't feel as though we're taking away their, their, their parking space. That didn't bother me one bit. So, you know, Andy's Barbershop still thrived, and I, and I got a reputation then of not, not taking any, uh, to use the word crap, from anybody because that was my responsibility. But people knew yeah. Uh, at Andy's and here at Stones, that they could, this was a place where they could come and talk about those things, yeah. learn about those things, yeah. and, and it was all respectful. It's sort of like the old days after town meeting, we would go out, no matter how controversial it was, we'd all go out, and, That's and, it. and in, the, in the, the spirit of Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, you and I could do battle on the floor of town meeting and then go have a drink at Clyde's. Uh, or in late years Leah, to the quarter deck, Leah, Leah McGuire's, you know, there's so many places I, I we used to go th drinking. I used to throw the party at Leah McGuire's and pick up the tab. Oh, I remember. That's back when I was still <laughs> yeah. drinking, so I would love to go there with <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> but anyway, it was a way of, for everybody to get together, forget what you didn't agree with, let's all have a drink and go home. And, yeah, and no, that was so no. important. But Phil, yeah. although you weren't directly involved in politics, you know, uh, I've been blessed to be part of your life and have you as my dad for the last almost 40 years. And I know because I got involved in politics at a young age, that sort of thrust you into politics as well because people would come in here, the Stones, and whether you liked it or not, <laughs> they would either praise what was going on at Town Hall or complain about it, and you had to put up with it. So Yeah, every, every customer was always right in here, <laughs> whether, whether right or wrong. They were always right. Except when they gave you a hard time about me, right? Then yeah, were... I stuck up for you a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I can't say the right words that I... When they were knocking you, I said, that's my son. That's right. And if you want to get out of here with two ears, yeah. you better change your mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have a lot of stories that I can tell. When I was uh, a selectman, there's a lot of things that go on that most of the people don't understand, and a lot of my controversies were in the best interest of the town. Well, and I think you and I certainly share that. Uh, yeah. But taking it back to to here, what one of the things I loved about coming in here, particularly when I was on the board of selectmen, is, it, and and I know it was the same way. At your place, because Andy, over the years, even though I came here to Stones to get my yeah. hair cut, I would stop in and see you, and oh, yeah. we would talk about stuff, yeah. and so I've spent a lot of time in both places, and almost always when you would go in there, there would be someone from the community, some community volunteer yeah. or a politician yeah. that you could talk about the issues of the day with, yeah. right? And, you know, I know uh, uh, you talk about John DeMello, and of course his son Jack was sheriff. Yeah. Uh, I don't know which one of you cut his hair, but I'm going to guess it was one of you. Uh, I cut John DeMello and Jack DeMello. Okay, so, yeah. there you go. And I think they were Andy's customers, too, because oh. they were public officials. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, But the, I cut John DeMello's hair when I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm. And I was a pretty goddamn good barber. Well, I think you still are. You still are. So, so Phil, you have officially retired last year, uh, last summer, after 60 seven years yeah. cutting hair. And Andy, you recently retired just a few months Seven. ago. 
70 uh, 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 70 so between the two of you the between the two of you that's almost almost <laughs> 150 years of barbering yeah. in this community yeah uh, I, if you had to pick one or a couple of most memorable moments uh, could could you could you come up with one not in the barber shop but my my most memorable moments were the political moments that I made a decision which affected maybe one or two people but turned out to be in the best interest of the town and uh, very highly controversial I, I, I remember the uh, well I, I don't want to get into it because it was a Cape Verdean incident and, uh, so Phil uh, so I can tell you some stories I'm sure you could <laughs> what's your most memorable time at Stone's Barbershop. It spans almost 70 years. The day you quit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it is. Maybe it's the day you retired when... Mondays. Uh, Mondays. <laughs> that's, so yeah. barbershops are always closed on Mondays. And one yeah. of the things I like no, is... No, wait, wait. The correction on that. Remember when they used to close on Wednesdays and the barbers that's, got that's together? That's right. When we and first and we started... Did, we decided was everybody Wednesdays. else gets two days off. I says, why the hell can't we? That was Harry, Harry and I and, and Stone. Yeah. And we changed... We changed the uh, the hours to Monday. There was uh, the guy in East Falmouth, the independent in East Falmouth. He didn't want to do it, and there was a couple other shops. They didn't was want to do it. Was that Danny? Huh? No, no. Who, who they, I don't remember a barber shop. Oh, Christ, yeah. There was a, a barber shop in that little house right one uh, near Acapesca Road. Oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah. So we're all learning something. So speaking about locations, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things Phil and I did in preparing for today, uh, a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday, we uh, we grabbed a couple of bagels in the morning and sat out uh, on those picnic tables and just walked up and down Main Street and yeah. sort of took a stroll down memory lane because yeah. some of the uh, uh, stores are the same as they were when, when you were cutting hair there 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but many of them have changed. So uh, uh, I know over the years in the plaza, where your place was for so many decades, uh, when I was a kid, Stop and Shop was where Staples is, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That, pretty they, sure. They, Friendly's they, was in the plaza there. Right in the middle. Right? First and Corey's Cards and Gifts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Where the bowling alley is was... Uh, uh, a grocery store where our town clerk Mike Palmer worked as a kid. Where? Was the bowling alley. Uh, well, before the bowling alley. Yeah. See, now I'm saying the bowling alley, but it hasn't been a bowling alley Started for 20 out, years where Cappy's is now. It was built as, yeah. a, bowl, built yeah. as a bowling Jack alley. Jack Kavanaugh owned that yeah. bowling yeah. alley. Yeah. He started it. And he was a good uh, friend of our family. And it's, of course, across the street there was Gardner Lewis's Pancake Man. Oh, yeah. Right. Almost, almost that. the court. That's right. Almost the court. Oh, did that start out on Worcester Court? Gardner Lewis moved that whole building across the plaza lot. The, the whole building? No kidding. The whole building came right wow. down across the lot and got settled because uh, there was nothing on that side, on the other side. And First mm -hmm. National had the first option for that property. Stop and Shop in their wisdom invited the First National come over here with a 99 year lease and that's how First National got in the same block. First National and Grants came together. Woolworths and Stop and Shop were. And then the in-between there was the, uh, the beauty salon, the, the bank, uh, the cleaners, uh, Woolworths. Woolworths was down across the street from our barber shop. Who? Woolworths. Yeah. You mentioned Woolworths, yeah. didn't you? That was across the street from my Stone's Beauty and Barber shops. Oh, was it before it went in the plaza? Yeah, when I was a younger barber. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the, 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 the cleaners, so right almost, well, a couple doors down from Andy's that was, was your father cleaners that my, my dad had. Right, that's right. right. Yeah, that's, that's going, I knew you, I knew going way father. back. Yeah. Wait a minute. I, I made a mistake. It was J.J. Newberry's right. across the street. Right. And Woolworth 
put them out of business, I okay. think. And Woolworths had a lunch counter, didn't they? They did. I remember sitting at that lunch counter as a little kid. Of course, that's almost 50 years ago, but uh, yeah. amazing. And so to going down Main Street now, and the folks love these strolls down memory lane because you guys capture so much of the town's history of the last century. Uh, we've talked about this before, Phil. So you were down uh, further down M Main Street uh, in the block that now has celebrations uh, next to what's Maxwell's, yeah. uh, back then was a movie theater. That's right, uh, Elizabeth Theater. What other stores were in that area then? Uh, we were in the, the Cape Cod Times was- That's right, Cape Cod Times, yeah. Next to the barber and beauty salon yeah. that we owned. Yeah. And uh, Ben and Bill's, where the ice cream place is, that used to be the store of Three Wonders. Do you remember that? <laughs> the guy, no. his, oh, his saying was, <laughs> you wonder where it is, and I wonder if I have it, and you wonder how I find it. It was a mismatch. <laughs> it was... It's great. <laughs> that was before Max Korn. You remember Maxie Korn? He gave me my first mortgage. I used to run errands for him. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that great? So another local. And he was Max Harry's. Cohen. And of when course, Harry his daughter Shirley Baker still manages many of his properties. Yeah, I want, I want to give you guys a little humor about J.J. Newberry. I grew up my first couple of years of my life on uh, Walker Street, Haddon. Haddon. The, 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 oh yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. That's the, so the any, village school. Huh? No. But anyway. Haddon Avenue's right no, next to Village not Haddon, School. Glenwood Place. Glenwood oh. Place. Oh, yeah. We lived in the third house. So, anyway, one day, I was about three or four years old. I walked into J.J. Newbury and took a, a little car, one of those crank up cars, off the counter, and I was playing with it on the sidewalk out front, right? So the, the woman come out and she says, you got to put that back up there. Meanwhile, Chief Baker comes by and uh, the, the woman tells, you know, that I was playing on the sidewalk in front with the car, but I have to put it back. So the Chief Baker says, uh, let, me, let me take you home. I says, I don't like you and I don't like your goddamn car. And I ran home four, four years old. <laughs> I never forgot the goddamn story. <laughs> that was Chief Baker. Chief Baker. That yeah. was Harold Baker, right? Harold Baker. Yeah. Him yeah. and my father were very close friends. But anyway, yeah. it's a little nostalgia for what took place downtown. Yeah. But then it started... The town started to move up. It was probably what in the sixties, before you guys came here. Yeah, it started to move. We up came here and Carol Ekes has built a building. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean so the village started migrating? This migrating, way. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we when were I here started, before Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, right. I, I, I yeah, I remember because uh, the uh, just down the street. One of the original uh, D'Angelo's was not where this one is, but on the other side of the street, if you remember. Next to the summer mm. theater that we had. Yeah. It was Mary Pino. Do you remember her? Who? Of, of course. Mary Pino. Oh, God, yeah. Mary's son, John. Mary, she just she just had uh, Mary's Dream. Mary's Dream yeah. restaurant. Look like a Hawaiian building, right? So let's talk about that because that's that's another uh, long time location that's got a storied history. So I'm going to tell the history as I've learned it, but I have only learned it from guys like you and others. I wasn't around then; I wasn't alive then. Yeah. But where the Angelos is now originally was a small little place small, called Mary's Lunch, like a right? shack. That's right. And then and Mary's Mary Lunch Pino, became Mary's, Mary's Dream. Dream. Because she had this beautiful dream of building the A-frame. Now, in my lifetime, I remember after Mary's dream, because that didn't quite make it, but Mary continued to live in right the now. back in that little right greenhouse. Yeah. And the Mary's dream became the house of Wong, the Chinese place. Yeah. That's the Chinese right. restaurant, yeah, that's right? right. Yeah. 
I, I, I know part of that history because Mary's son, John, yeah. uh, who recently left us, uh, I worked with John Penno as a kid when I worked at John's liquor store yeah. down the street. And of yeah. course, that location uh, has been in the Ferreira family for as long as Stone's Barbershop was yeah, around. That... Uh, run still by Mark Ferreira, an old and dear yeah. friend of mine, and I started yeah. working for Mark when I was 16. I could have. Um, I and that was a Stone's Barbershop connection. So I got the job at uh, John's Liquor Store because a guy that worked for you, Steve Riccato, yeah, who then went on to open Steve's Barbershop in Mashpee, worked part-time at John's for Mark. And I was looking for work uh, when I was in high school for the summer. And Steve went and talked to Mark, and I went and introduced myself. I think I dressed like this to go and interview to do bottle redemption. <laughs> And the rest is history. I worked there for 12 years all through college. Yeah. And uh, yeah. a lot of memories there. Because out front at John's Liquor Store now, uh, where the the, uh, the window is, right, was an ice cream shop, wasn't it? Where? At John's. I'm pretty sure uh, if you look at the building to the left, so that would be on the east side of the building, there's a cutout that used to be, uh, they used to sell ice cream out of there. So maybe that's a little trivia that remember. you guys didn't that, that, remember. That'll, that'll My come. memory is as bad as Andy's. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we're going over 70 years of history, and oh, your, yeah. both of your memories are pretty good. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, Mary's, Mary's original little lunch, and she had John, who used to be a mailman, and he got canned because he threw, threw some mail away. I remember that story. Yeah. I was very friendly in school with his younger brother, Edmund. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you know him? I knew them all. Yeah. 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 But anyway, uh, I once worked one one day for Mary, Mary's dream as a short of a cook. She was working this all by herself because her chef or one of her relatives that was working with her had walked out on her. And the place was so goddamn busy. It was a busy, busy little place. So I told Mary, I says, I'll help you. I says, I'll go in the kitchen. And she she was the uh, counter girl taking care of the customers. And I, I ran the kitchen. Yeah. No kidding? Yeah. Just that one day. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a little bit of local history, oh, though. I God, think that yeah. probably... We yeah. wouldn't have known were yeah. we were not sitting yeah. here. I, I didn't want to see her struggle because she was a workaholic for Christ's sake, so, you know, four foot eleven, and, and uh, I forget how old she was at the time. I remember Mary because John would uh, take her always uh, to uh, to mass at St. Anthony's yeah. where he sang in the choir, yeah. and then he would take her to dinner yeah. on Saturdays. A lot of history here. Oh God, I, there's so much that has changed and uh, some of it I I have to accept but I didn't agree, didn't have didn't want to agree and that's uh, you know like the senior center I can't stand the uh, the new senior center oh worst goddamn location ever but it's there I'll never go in it because you know my mother was part of that for years but now, at 90 years old, are you allowed to go in the senior center? Is there an upper age limit to go in there? Uh, I, yeah. I'm kidding with you. No, no. That, I, I'm trying to think if you I don't have, think there is an upper I think, limit. I think you have to have somebody wheel you in. <laughs> huh? Well, you're both pretty ambulatory for almost 90 years old. Phil's a few years behind you. Yeah. Yeah. He still gets around pretty good. Yeah. And that's, we'll, we'll so feel. you've seen so much, uh, not only nationally, right? I mean, when you think about it, you got into barbering in the 50s. And everything that's happened in the United States since then, uh, you've seen half a century of history oh, unfold. Yeah. But even here locally, you know, locally. we talked really about the changing government and the different people, the different characters that have been involved in the government over the years. Yeah. And all of them at one time or another came across the threshold of, of Stone's Barbershop or Andy's or Harry's or Danny, some of the others. But, uh, you know, uh, it, two prominent institutions uh, those characters, you know, all came across this threshold. And we would talk about, uh, you and I, Phil, have talked about, you know, uh, politics here in town and the government and people 
movers and shakers, decision makers in town yeah. where you've cut their hair. I think Bob Marshall, the longtime yeah. moderator, sat in your chair and had many yeah. great discussions. Yeah. And of course, he Andy, had marshmallows. He did. Bob had Where marshmallows. Where is the surfboard place now? Right. On, on that Street. used to be Isaacson's. Yeah. Now you remember who, Isaacson's? Yes, I do. You remember Stanley? Who? Stone? Stanley. Oh. <laughs> Why you, you laughing? You bring up a memory, a memory with Stanley. Jesus Christ. Whether it was, Is this X-rated show? No, no. But we do have the magic of editing, so we'll wait and see what uh, what. You what don't want to take out, anything but, out of the show. Uh, but but that's, that's what I love. Is yeah, that right. There's... Uh, the, in a barbershop, there is no editing, right? I mean, what happened happened, and sometimes there were strong opinions. Yeah, but there's never but... language like we, Andy and I have used. Wow, what, 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 don't point at yourself. I, <laughs> I haven't said anything bad. <laughs> okay. Well, you don't hear. I have hearing aids, and I right. hear you. So you guys have had, as our viewers can see, and it's wonderful, uh, uh, a rivalry, but not a competitive rivalry, no, just a no, friendly hell no. competition over the years, and you both thrived and had wonderful storied careers. Uh, oh. But in recent years, uh, with the dawn of the Internet, uh, they've, they do this thing called online polling, right? And people go online, and they fill out a poll, and they do the best of their favorites yeah. right, online. And so uh, for many years now, they've been conducting the best of, of the Upper Cape, Falmouth Mashpee, Born and Sandwich. Yeah. And Stones and Andy's actually have been neck and neck in the best barbershop in the Upper Cape. Yeah. Stones, and I know, Stones was picked the best barbershop this year. Well, that's where I was Only because I closed. So, <laughs> so Andy sort of had the mantle for the last few years, but Phil Stones we, we jumped out in front of him this year. We were before you closed, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of your career, you can say that you, you retired from the best barbershop in the Upper that, Cape, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, yes. So, yeah. I always think of Stone's Barbershop as the best barbershop in the world. Well, and you rightfully so and think Andy of Andy's thinks like, his place is right. better. But this year, not because of me, because I haven't been involved here for the last five or six years. We were voted number one, yeah. and this is today. You can't do anything about yesterday, right? No, but we're number one today, and and, and not for me. And Trish Stone deserves a lot of credit for carrying of on that she legacy does. of, yeah. of uh, your of course dad and does. your mom and your brother and you. And she's really done a wonderful job, I think, uh, preserving what we see here in our visit today. Much yeah. of the artifacts, Phil here in the shop uh, are from the complete history of Stone's Barbershop. Over your shoulder is a photograph of uh, President John F. Kennedy. Uh, He's my hero. And I know your dad actually had some in, involvement with the president. He had a, a president. personal letter writ written when he was a senator. My father was the head of the, he's more outgoing than I was ever. He was the head of the town Democratic Committee in this. And if you didn't come over in the Mayflower, <laughs> you weren't invited to Cape Cod. Yeah. Uh, you agree with me that? Uh, hey, listen, can't say anything bad about Cape Cod to me. I've been here. I started my life here, and I'm going to be uh, buried up on Gifford Street, front row. Front row. The plot is already bought. Just like in town meeting, you always sat in the front row. Only after Betty Littner said I could do it. Did you know that? No. But, so tell that story. Because Dickie sat, Dickie Stone, Phil's brother, sat in the front row, but on the other, on the side, other side. Because you were both counters that counted the votes at town meeting. I used to sit next to Betty Littner. I was the only guy with that kind of courage. Full name Elizabeth Buckby Littner. That's it. That's what she, how you, she used to identify herself at town meeting. Uh, that's right. So I was the only one that had the courage to sit next to her. We used to call her Dragon Breath, a lovely lady, right? So the, hey, la the, la Andy's. the last time she came in, she came in on a wheelchair. I remember. 
All right. She and I had a great relationship. And, and the seat was empty. And I went over and asked her if I could sit in her chair. Her words to me, and I never forgot them, I wouldn't want anyone else to sit there. What a great legacy. Yeah. Well, I gave that seat up the next town meeting. No more. I'm all done. Phil was talking about how his dad had interaction with JFK. You've been very politically active over the years, Andy, and I'm sure. Uh, uh, so who's the most uh, memorable politician you ever got to interact with, other than me, of course? Well, other than you, there's nobody who tops that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I can't remember. I really don't. President Kennedy's uh, brother, Senator yeah. Ted Kennedy, I know was a friend of yours. Yeah. He but, was no Jack Kennedy. And you can quote me on that. Well, that, but that's the beauty of being in the barbershop. We can share our yeah. opinions and, and, yeah. and walk away friends. Uh, yeah, but uh, hey, you know what I got at my house I'm going to give you? I have uh, one of these tie, one for here and a set of cufflinks. Cufflinks. Oh, I love cufflinks. Thank you. Yeah, they're very, very pure gold. So, but when I see it, thank I'm, you. I got them on my bureau to throw away. Oh, thank you. Well, I, never used. They're in the box. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. I, yeah. And I will. I could never stand French coffee. I will wear them. I wear them every day. Uh, yeah. I will wear them in in your honor. And speaking of doing things in the honor of others, as we get ready to wind down here. Hey, wear them for Andy. I will. Don't wear them for me. I, I will proudly. Wear I them love for Andy. them, but. Well, every day when I get up, I honor you, Phil. Every day. Okay. Thank uh, you. But and I used to stick up for you. I, and it cost me a couple of customers. <laughs> they probably went to, to, to Andy. So I've had a flood of memories sitting here for the last hour with you guys talking about so much of our history. And it's been my honor to be involved in this community's history for a long time as well. And uh, I can't help but to, the, still, the memories keep flooding back to me about our mutual friend. So I have to, to pay him some homage here. Uh, uh, now, which one of you cut Eddie Marx's hair? Had to be you, right? Because, uh, you know, you, you and Eddie were friends and rivals. And, uh, no, right. you know, I had the, 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 the honor, the blessing to speak uh, at his funeral and yeah. deliver one of the eulogies. And uh, around that same time, had the honor to speak at your, I think at the time, 80th. But was that your 80th party at the Kuna Messet? Mine? Yeah. Wow. Right? I, it was yours. Yeah. yeah. If you remember, I was one of the speakers it was there. It Flying Bridge, wasn't it? It was at the, pretty sure it was the Kuna Messet. Uh, Whatever. Yeah, one of Bill Zammer's properties, anyway. But yeah. But so so uh, local figures like Eddie Marks really shaped the history of our community, and he was along with you. And I'm being sincere, one of my mentors, and showed me how to give back and and be part of the community. Uh, but this show wouldn't this show about local history and barbershops and local icons wouldn't be complete if we didn't at least. Uh, pay a little uh, homage to, to our yeah. good and mutual friend, Eddie Marks. A lot well, of memories with that guy. And he used to, even though he got his hair cut at Andy's, I know from time to time he would stop in here just to say hello. And, yeah, uh, Eddie was a nice guy. He was a good friend of Dickie's because yeah. they were both involved in the community. And, yeah. Uh, well, and big on sports. He loved sports. He and Dick Corey would stand up on the hill, right, and watch every Falmouth High football game. Yeah. Dick yeah. Corey, who's still with us, of course, and uh, I just played, turned 90 himself. I played against Dick Corey. Did you really? New Bedford Vocational lost 13-7 in 1947. And they, I think Dick Corey uh, and Eddie Marks were on the same, same undefeated team. Falmouth High football team. 1947. And a generation later, Dick's son, Ricky, who's a dear friend of mine, was on an undefeated Falmouth football team. Yeah, so, yeah. And those are the kind of stories you get when you come to the barbershop. Yeah. Really, th unless you look at the Enterprise archives from the last hundred years, yeah. you can't get a local history any place more than you can in the local barbershop. Because look at the pictures surrounding us here. Uh, show the history of our community. There's many photos of Dickie Stone coaching and playing hockey. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's pictures of Dick over the register. Yeah. The customers still get to greet him every time yeah. they come in here. Yeah. And uh, and Phil, over your left shoulder is uh, uh, the the nameplates of some people that have cut hair over the years. Your brother Dick and your dad Frank. Uh, 
Yeah. And, and even a, a sign remembering one of the local characters from Stone's uh, Duck Soup. I don't know if Andy knew Duck Soup. He used to come in here. He was a hell of a nice guy. Duck Soup? Not by that name. I, I forget his real name. but His name was uh, George Mather, I believe. George Mather, yeah. yeah. And he was, he worked at the quarter deck cleaning the quarter deck for Dave Jarvis. Yeah. I don't, no, he didn't work for Dave Jarvis. Who did Dave Jarvis buy that from? Uh, Rob and Rita Pacheco. Yeah, but he worked for a, the- Chet Wright, right? Didn't Chet, Chet, Chet Wright. Wright. Chet Wright. That's right. He worked for We just Chet went through Wright. the 50 years of the history hey, of the you, quarter deck there. You remember better than I do. Well, you should be sitting in this chair. Well, it's because <laughs> of what you both have shared with me over yeah. the years. <laughs> yeah, the quarter deck, another local institution. Hey, well, let's do this. All right. And you know what? What a great way to close. Thank you for <laughs> doing that. All right. Okay. So uh, we're going to wind down our time here. Uh, thank you. Hard to believe more than an hour has gone by. Uh, yeah. And I am so profoundly grateful well to if you want to go another hour we could we, we we could but i don't know if people would watch more than that and i have to get back no, to I'm work ju- i'm just uh, kidding so but let's do it again uh, yeah. this was a lot of fun yeah so any closing thoughts andy as we wind down our time here together well no i i think uh phil and i are both in our retirement era yeah uh, my goal is 105 there's a few people i haven't ticked off yet but i want to I want to make sure I get everybody going, and uh, I've had a good a good public life, good business life, uh, and I look back when I was a kid growing up. I started down on in the center of town. I've been in Falmouth Heights for 40 years, 50, 60, 70, 60 odd years, 70 years. I I don't have a complaint going, none. Financially, I'm well off. Uh, it's been a good life. Hey, been great, Andy, good I wish I was life. as financially well off as you are. Like hell, you've t- you you collected a ton of money. You're the one that who got, who who won all the money. Uh, Phil, so, Dicky, Dick a little won. more local trivia. Phil's brother Dick won mega bucks. Yes. Yeah. Who a was long that? time ago. Dicky. Dick did. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I thought it was you. So, but Phil, all in no. all, uh, uh, barbering well, has been good to you as well. You've lived a, a good life. I'm a poor barber. He's a rich barber. Yeah, but, but you've, you've li- ri- lived a rich life. I've lived the right. If yeah. friends uh, oh, yeah. and and the love of others were life's currency, you would both be very very wealthy men, right? Uh, if friendship were gold, you'd have unlimited resources. Isn't that right. not true? And that all Listen, comes I, from abs- your life absolutely. in the barbershop. I'm glad I took the advice of Max Cohen when I got out of the Navy and I, the Thelmet National Bank turned me down my first mortgage request. I never forgave them, right? Was that Gordon Miller? Yes, yes. I used to cut his hair. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna you should have told him he had a hell of a haircut. Well, I, I, I wasn't good enough to be in that bank. No, he that, never... that was a goddamn Yankee bank, and I don't give a damn who, who hears me say that. Huh? Well, and I, I, never I thought d- Gordon went, Miller was uh, a nice guy because I took care of him. Yeah, uh, well, but anyway, the uh, we don't want to put people down, Andy. What's that? Can you hear me? <laughs> don't point your finger at me. All right. Are, so I asked you. I, I'm <laughs> Italian. I speak with my hands. Oh, okay. I, you know, I, I all all through the last hour, I wondered why you spoke that way. So you know what? what so I hands. can't. I can't let the, <laughs> us, the show finish now that you guys have brought up that up, without telling this one last story. So Phil, people know you as Phil Stone. Yeah. It's a common and prominent name in the community because you and your brother, uh, and now your sister-in-law and your parents built that name up uh, as hardworking, honest business people in this town. But Stone, truth be told, isn't. Your real last name, right? No. When I, my my father moved from Boston 
do you remember I told you if you didn't come over in the Mayflower? Right. You weren't welcome in Falmouth. Well, that's why I'm having you tell this story. Okay. My name was Petra Feta. That's a good Italian name. Italian names in, end in vowels. A-E-I-O-U. They're all vowels. And my father had to change his name to Stone, which is a, Petro was Italian Baroque. And Petrofetta was a derivative of that. And in order to be successful, there was no more barber and beauty salon more successful. Successful, not for me, from Frank and Teresa Stone. So uh, we were the we biggest were, on the Cape. Interesting piece of local history. That was around World War II, where there was a lot of anti-Italian sentiment. So. Your That's dad right. actually changed the name to be yeah. more accepted yeah. in this community. That wouldn't happen today because Falmouth is a richly diverse and very accepting community. It's but it's not, interesting it's, to see that journey over the years when there was perhaps less tolerance in this community than there was yeah. than there is today. That's right. So, uh, any final thoughts for our visit? It was great. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Hey, I'm glad you invited me. I'm glad I did, too. We'll do this again for sure. Andy Dufresne from Andy's Barbershop, Navy veteran. We thank you for your service, and thank you for coming today. Phil Stone from Stone's Barbershop, thank you for your Navy service, and thank you for coming today, fellas. It has been an absolute pleasure to take this stroll down, and thank you for joining us for this wonderful oral history of barbering in Falmouth. But as you saw, we really gave you a history of this community from the last 70 years, so thank you for joining us. Be safe, and we'll see you soon.